My role today is just to do a short introduction about identity surface MG because this is what you'll be using in one of the workshop. Uh, this and uh, I follow a little bit the outline uh, that uh, Alejandro, uh, this is what Alejandro asked me uh, to talk about. Uh, we will explain a little bit how the EMG signal is generated, this frequency content, which type of electrode we can use to detect EMG. Few experimental considerations, because you will hear much more during the uh, training this afternoon, uh, how we filter the EMG and a little bit about decomposition. And again, this is something that you will hear more about this, uh, this afternoon. So whenever uh, we move, at least whenever we move voluntarily, uh, there is a command that uh, travel starts at the brain, travel to the spinal cord. At the spinal cord, we have motor neurons, and their axon uh, exits the spinal cord to, to um, reach the muscles. And uh, uh, actually, in uh, one muscle, in one muscle, we have many fibers, and uh, each uh, the axon of each motor neuron uh, synapses uh, onto many uh, fibers in a uh, junction that we call the neuromuscular junction. This is just a cartoon, but the, uh, on the right side, you can actually see uh, an image that has been taken uh, from an animal model, and uh, you can actually see how the nerve, the green, the, uh, green part, uh, synapses onto the muscle fiber, which are the most, uh, the most reddish one. And uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, one motor neuron uh, in one motor neuron innervates multiple fibers, and uh, these fibers innervated by multiple motor neurons are intermi intermingled. So we usually refer, uh, uh, we usually use the word motor unit to indicate the set of a motor neuron and the fibers that there are innervated by this uh, motor. Now, uh, in one muscle, uh, we have uh, a certain number of motor neurons. And this number depends on the muscle function. So we have a small uh, hand muscle, like for instance, the first dorsal interosseus, where uh, the number of motor uh, uh, units or neuron is the same, is about 100. But we have a very powerful muscle, such as uh, the masseter, for instance, of muscle from the thigh, uh, that uh, need to assert ma much more power. And in this case, we have more motor unit uh, uh, composing them. Now, uh, if we want uh, um, to detect electrical activity of the muscle, we can use different electrodes. We can place electrodes on the surface of the skin, and we refer to this as surface electrode, or we can uh, use intramuscular electrodes that are basically electrodes that we introduce into the muscle. And this can be wires or needles. And uh, which electrode we use depends uh, on, the, on the application, and we'll go back to that. But how is this? Uh, uh, we usually use the acronym EMG to define an electromyographic signal. How is this EMG generated? So each neuron, uh, when activated, oh, well, uh, basically, usually, you have a, a, a potential of the membrane that is negative. And when the motor neuron receives inputs, uh, for instance, uh, from the brain, from uh, other neurons, uh, uh, if uh, uh, this input is uh, big enough, so that the uh, uh, potential of the membrane changes uh, exceeds a certain threshold, we have the discharge of an action potential. Now, the action potential travels from the uh, motor neuron uh, to the fibers, uh, reaches the neuromuscular junction, and then, as you have seen, it travels uh, to the right and the left, in this case, so towards the two tendons. And this is the... Uh, elemental electrical activity that uh, you have in each motor, uh, from each motor neuron. But uh, uh, when a motor neuron is activated, usually discharge more than once. So what you actually have is uh, uh, a train of fashion potential, which is what you have here on the right side. And uh, the more force you need, the more uh, uh, motor neurons become active. So at the end, actually, you have many trains of fashion potential resulting from a muscle activation. And when you place the electrode on the surface of the muscle, you get a signal like that. So you see there is a lot of interference and you cannot distinguish the contribution of each individual unit. But if you place an intramuscular electrode, uh, actually, uh, 
what you can see here, here we have the same motor unit, the same uh, uh, motor unit as before. But if you compare the action potentials, like this train here and here, you can see that now they are much more spiky. Uh, so they have high frequency content. And uh, so when uh, we actually place an electrode within the muscle, uh, we have less overlap uh, between uh, different action potential. And the signal that you record is much more sparse as this one. Actually, there are two reasons why the signal is uh, more sparse. So one is that intramuscular electrode is much more selective. And the other one is that the action potential per se are uh, uh, narrower in time. So they have higher frequency. In fact, uh, what happens is that uh, between, uh, uh, let's imagine, so in this cartoon, you have here on the bottom side, uh, the muscle per se. And then you have uh, a layer of adipose tissue and a layer of the skin. And when you record surface electrode, you place the electrodes here at this level. And when you record the uh, intramuscular signal, you actually place the electrode in this region. And these are two action potentials that uh, have been recorded uh, with an intramuscular electrode and also with surface electrode. And you see that there is a huge difference in the frequency content. So there are uh, very narrow in time when they are recorded within the muscle. But then, like if you place the electrode on the surface of the muscle, actually they become, uh, um, uh, they decrease their amplitude that they become uh, wider in time. And this is because uh, um, the tissue that is in between the muscle and the electrode actually acts as a low pass filter. And this is also the reason why uh, the bandwidth of the surface signal and the intramuscular signal is different. So if we record the surface EMG, uh, the bandwidth is between 20 and 500 hertz. So usually we use a sampling frequency of uh, 1K. While uh, if we place an electrode within the muscle and we record intramuscular signal, the bandwidth is actually higher than 1K. Uh, because uh, as I mentioned before, the signal are much more, uh, as much spiker. And as a consequence, we need to sample these a much higher frequency. So as I mentioned uh, before, like this uh, uh, few slides are mainly dedicated to, to surface signals because we will have uh, another workshop later on in uh, our hybrid neuro project that will be dedicated to invasive recordings. So uh, the electrodes uh, that uh, I'm going to present in next slide are actually the electrodes that we use for uh, surface EMG recordings. And uh, the classical configuration is actually bipolar electrodes. So you place two electrodes and you calculate the difference in voltage between the two points where the electrodes are placed. And uh, um, you can also use an, an array of electrodes. So you have, uh, in this case, for instance, eight detection points uh, in a linear configuration, or you can have uh, bidimensional electrodes. So grids, for instance, in this case, you have uh, a configuration of eight by eight electrodes. And uh, which type of electrode you, you use depends on the application. So I actually provided an example of uh, the different uh, application that I indicated here. So uh, bipolar electrodes are used uh, if you want to extract the envelope of the signal or, or the amplitude or understand when the signal becomes active. So in this picture, for instance, you have in black an EMG signal, and uh, if you want to calculate the envelope, you simply um, uh, square it or you take the absolute value and then uh, you apply a low pass filter. And as a result, you get the envelope that is this red part. And now it becomes easy also to calculate the amplitude because I mean, the EMG signal is stochastic, so it's better actually, and it varies with a very high frequency, so it's actually better to take an average as we did with a low pass filter in order to, to understand the amplitude. And also bipolar electrodes are used uh, if we are interested in the signal timing. For instance, if we want to understand when a muscle is active, or we want to uh, detect the EMG on onset, what is usually done is um, you calculate the baseline noise. So you take a portion of the signal where uh, uh, the muscle is not active. And uh, usually you set a threshold that is uh, two, three times the baseline noise and whatever is above, is considered actually muscle activation. So in this case, for instance, the intercession is here. 
So you can actually consider this as the onset of the activation of the EMG signal. Why do we use uh, uh, arrays instead? Um, arrays are used in uh, other applications, such as to determine the innervation zone or how long are the fibers, and also to determine uh, how to better position or, or how to position the electrodes in an optimal way. Uh, so you see here in this slide, again, on the bottom, you have the muscle, and then you have uh, adipose tissue and skin, and these three P corresponds to three electrodes that have been placed on top of the skin. So there are surface electrodes. Here you have the neuromuscular junction. So, so this is the innervation zone of the muscle. And if you have a national potential, and uh, you see that uh, when this travels towards the tendon, if you have three electrodes uh, uh, placed uh, uh, like that, it will take some time for the signal to travel from point one to point two to point three. So what happens from a, a signal point of view is that the same action potential will be delayed in time. And this is simply due to the time that the signal takes to travel from P1 to P2, from P2 to P3. So uh, how is this useful to understand where we have the innervation zone? Now, if we place uh, an array of electrodes uh, on top of the muscle, and we actually record them in a bipolar configuration. So we make a difference between the signal recorded at electrode one versus two, electrode two versus three, and so on. You have signals like that if the contraction level is low. So let's focus on uh, uh, this signal here, this part of the signal here. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, oh, well. So you see that the polarity of the signal, the signal is negative first and then positive, negative, positive, and it's like that along this line. But on the bottom, the polarity is inverted. So you have the positive wave first and the negative wave after. So in correspondence of the region where the signal changes polarity is actually where the nerve innervates the muscle, or at least you have the neuromuscular junction for this, uh, for this unit. And this is what we refer to as innervation zone. Now, uh, if you continue, uh, if you look at the bottom of the signal, you can actually see that there is no propagation anymore. You don't recognize this waveform that translates to the right as before. And where the signal stops propagating is because there is the tendon here. So, and there you have only non propagating components. So, if we have uh, an image like that that has been obtained from a race, uh, we can actually calculate the difference between the innervation zone and the tendon, and this gives us an indication of how long, uh, how long the fibers can be. And this is sometimes uh, used uh, in order to understand uh, uh, how to position uh, uh, the electrodes, because this is the same image that you have seen before. And uh, imagine that uh, I cannot see. It. Imagine that you have the neuromuscular junction here. If you place two surface electrodes at the same distance from the neuromuscular junction, this is the blue amplifier. And if you place two electrodes uh, on the same uh, uh, side with respect to the innervation zone, you have a very different signals. So in the first case, you get zero, although there is electrical activity, because the two signals going to the right and to the left cancel each other. But if you place the two electrodes on the same side of on the same side of the innervation zone, you actually are able to detect electrical signal. So electrical position matters, especially in some applications. So usually, when you have uh, bipolar electrodes, you place them on the same side of the innervation zone. Now this is uh, a little bit less critical for uh, uh, what we want to do when we want to decompose the signal is actually maybe beneficial to be on top of the innervation zone, but uh, we'll go back to that. Uh, now, when do we use grids instead? So there are uh, um, a few applications where grids uh, could be useful. For instance, like if we want to understand uh, a region of the muscle that is active. And this case, you usually do what is called a heat map. So, Let's imagine that this is a grid of electrodes uh, uh, placed on top of a muscle. Of course, the electrical activity changes uh, in time, over time, but also in space. So in this image uh, with the red colors, uh, we actually have uh, uh, high uh, 
voltage and with uh, blue colors, uh, we actually have low voltage. And what is usually done, like, uh, you know, if you have uh, a certain number of electrodes, you sample the electrical activity in each electrode. So in this case, you'll get something like that. And then you attribute this value that actually belongs to the electrode to the entire pixel, so to say. So you get an image like that. And of course, you can smooth it, but uh, like the original uh, uh, image uh, that uh, is, uh, is, is this one. And now here, uh, you can actually uh, somehow set up a threshold, for instance, like you can say, uh, for me, the active region is everything that is above uh, uh, zero or microvolt, and then uh, all this green region will be considered the active region. And also, uh, you can uh, you can actually sometimes uh, uh, you want to understand if the active regions are uh, different over a certain type of task. And uh, you have an example here. So in this case, uh, identity MG was recorded from tetrapicious muscle, and uh, the um, uh, participant, the study participant, was asked to contract the muscle for sixty seconds. And uh, you can see that over time, basically fatigue kicks in and uh, the region of the muscle that is active is changing. And so it's moving uh, more towards the cranial portion of the muscle. Originally, the muscle is active here and then like it starts to become active also in this region. So to track this change using only one number rather than the signal corresponding to, uh, I don't know, probably 64 electrodes, one possibility is actually to calculate the centroid of this uh, image, which is uh, this uh, uh, dark dot that you see here. And you can actually understand how these uh, uh, changes over time. So in indicating that uh, a muscle, like the trapecius, that's actually a big muscle, uh, can actually activate different portion in a certain task, uh, depending on, uh, because, because of fatigue in this specific. And uh, another uh, reason that perhaps is the most important in uh, in uh, in our project or uh, like in relation to the workshop that we have this uh, this afternoon, another reason why we use uh, 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 bidimensional grids of the electrode is when we want to decompose the EMG. And uh, why do we need uh, uh, grids of electrodes rather than only bipolar? So first of all, uh, I didn't say yet what is the composition, and I know most of you know, but just uh, just uh, one brief note in case this is uh, uh, in case there are people who, who don't work on that. So I show you before this slide when you have the generation of the uh, EMG signal. So we have said that the EMG signal uh, is made uh, is the sum of the train of action potentials. So you have the same action potential that repeats itself. And the time instance at which the signal is repeated is indicated by this uh, uh, um, pikes. Uh, now, decomposition means that from uh, this surface EMG that includes the contribution of all uh, uh, motor units that are under the electrode, we actually want to go back uh, to uh, the training, to the uh, firings of each motor unit. So we have this signal. And from the decomposition, we want to find out actually when the signal, when each single motor unit was active. This is what we refer to as decomposition. And uh, uh, the reason why it's not possible to decompose a signal, uh, uh, a surface signal, only using a few channels, is actually uh, well explained in this experimental study, where uh, basically one muscle with uh, about 200 motor motor unit, if I remember properly, was simulated. So you see here you have uh, uh, many red circles, and these red circles represent different motor units. So when, if a circle is big, that means that the fibers that belong to this motor unit are a bit more spread. And if it's small, that means that there are a, a bit more focus, and very likely there are less. Now, let's consider, uh, you see that uh, in this slide, there are, uh, I think, eight uh, of these territories that are marked in blue, and these belong to different motor units. Now, it happens that if you place a surface electrode, so a sur an electrode on the skin of the surface, 
depending on where the light is positioned, you can actually end up in this case. So you can actually see that the corresponding Gaussian potential looks the same. So in this condition, if you have only one electrode, it's impossible to distinguish this uh, action potential as belonging to the same motor unit, to different motor units, simply because they look the same. So you have no means to say that this uh, uh, comes from a different source. Now, if you have more electrode instead, so this is the case. So here you have like uh, a grid of uh, five by five electrodes. And uh, let's imagine uh, like, and this belong to the, this action potential belongs to the different motor units. But let's focus only on the central electrode. You see that the action potential looks exactly the same, right? So that means that if you would have placed only one electrode, you had no means to distinguish these two motor units because the action potential is exactly the same. And also, if you have a linear array, for instance, like if you consider this column and this column, the action potential looks very similar. But when, when you increase the number of electrodes, in this case, you have you add two columns to the right and two to the left, you can actually see that the action potential look different. And this is why, like, you actually need more electrodes in order to be able to distinguish. And um, uh, in this simulation, actually, they uh, increase the number of uh, channels that uh, um, uh, you can use in order, to in order to detect the units that are different from each other. So the action potential of, uh, you had the 200 motor units, as I say at the beginning, this is the image on the left. And if you have only one channel, only 22% of the motor units have a different uh, representation of the surface. But if you increase the number of channels, actually the, the motor units action potential become more different. So you can discriminate more. And this is the reason why regardless of the algorithm, uh, simply based on the shape of the signal, you actually need to have uh, many channels uh, in order to be able to decompose the surface EMG. Now, uh, Alejandro also asked me to, to talk a little bit or to do some uh, consideration about experiments. I think we will talk about that more in uh, uh, during the end zone training, but I reported here uh, like some uh, 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 um, sources where actually you can find uh, a lot of material also available open access where we talk a lot about uh, uh, the best practice for detecting and uh, uh, processing EMG signals. This come uh, from uh, the hybrid neuro consortium, but also from uh, other researchers. So, so you can have a look at them. But just like uh, to um, some, just to report into sentence what is important to, to focus on, like the EMG signal, like the action potential that uh, uh, you have seen in this, uh, images, for instance, like this shape here, basically depends on how far the electrode is from the source, so how far the electrode is from the motor unit, and which type of electrode you use. So if the electrode is big, this uh, will be more uh, uh, low pass. If it's small, it will be a bit sharper. If it's close to the muscle, the action potential will be uh, narrow in time. Uh, if it's far away, it will be smooth and so on. So for this reason, it's always important whenever you do an experiment to report electrode characteristics. So how big is the electrode, which is the shape, which is the distance between the electrode, is the electrode are gelled or dried. And uh, this uh, uh, helps in uh, interpreting the results, but also if people want to replicate your experiments, uh, uh, they know exactly what to have done. And uh, when it comes to the noise, uh, I mean, this presentation is. Uh, is meant to introduce you to uh, uh, identity MG decomposition. So uh, I think in general, like uh, um, uh, you can be, uh, or like noise perhaps is, uh, is less dramatic when you want to decompose, or some types of noise are less dramatic when you want to decompose a signal. For instance, like power line interference, the 50 hertz or 60 hertz, depending on the country where you are, that uh, is very uh, usually problematic when uh, 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 you want to, uh, when you record the bipolar signal, in the case of EMG decomposition will be simply recognized as another source. So um, is, uh, uh, we are a little bit more relaxed from, uh, from this point of view. But uh, uh, the advice is usually to try to reduce the noise as much as possible at the recording stage. 
So like movement artifacts that uh, usually come from the fact that the cable are not well uh, uh, fixed is something that uh, you should look at while uh, uh, you are recording the signal. And also the interference, if you can, is always better to reduce. Although, as I said before, it's not something very dramatic when you want to, to decompose. And uh, skin preparation is also very important because basically you reduce the um, uh, impedance between uh, uh, the skin and the electrode and as a result, your uh, EMG signal has better quality. But this is also something that uh, uh, you'll see this afternoon during, uh, during the workshop. Now, also about filtering, uh, um, uh, I didn't uh, uh, say much about the EMG in general. As I mentioned before, the bandwidth of the two signals is different. So it's always good to filter the signal in the bandwidth of interest. So below 20 Hz, you usually have movement artifact, and above 500 Hz, you have high frequency noise, which is something that you don't need because it doesn't belong to the signal. So you filter out. But uh, something that is relevant when, uh, uh, when you actually want to decompose the signal is uh, high pass uh, uh, filtering. And uh, to show why, I actually took a signal from EMG Lab, and this is an intramuscular signal, but I think uh, uh, he explained it's, uh, it's easier to, um, to get the concept using an intramuscular signal. So you see here that uh, you have, uh, uh, this is an EMG signal, and you see that uh, you have a portion of the signal where there is no activity, and from time to time you have something above the baseline noise. Now, if you I pass filter the signal, for instance, in this case at 100 Hz, you can actually see that now whenever there is activity, it stands out clearly from the baseline noise. And this is due to the I pass filtering that you have applied. So before you know that uh, there was some kind of activity, but now it's much more, it's much clearer what the activity is. And uh, if you focus on the lower panel, the panel here, you can also see that once we I pass filter the signal, you actually have these spikes that are much clearer and uh, more separated from each other. So when you I pass filter, the um, time support becomes narrow, and as a consequence, you have uh, less overlap between different action potentials. And this again facilitates the decomposition. And uh, um, so we have. Uh, um, Again, just one small slide to explain how the decomposition is, uh, is performed. So uh, we mentioned before that the composition, excuse me, means go back from the uh, interference signal to uh, the action potential of each individual motor units. And uh, uh, how this is done in, uh, in practice uh, well there are uh, there are different ways but uh, let's start from this um, uh, from this image on uh, emg generation so as we mentioned a few times by now uh, each emg signal is made by the sum of different trains of fashion potentials now if you have the same shape that repeats itself from a mathematical point of view you may know that this is a convolution so if you convolve this signal that are spikes in corresponding on the instance when uh, uh, there is uh, um, a discharge with the action potential shape, what you obtain is actually a train of action potentials. And uh, you can actually put it into a matrix form like that. So X is your EMG signal, S are the sources. So EMG signals, uh, well, you know how IMG signal look like, and here uh, we are imagining that we have M channels. Then what are the sources? The sources are, uh, if we go back to the previous slides, these are the sources. So basically are the time instance whenever there is uh, an action potential. And from a mathematical point of view, you can think about a vector where you have always zero when the, this action, this motor unit is not firing, and then you have a one when the motor unit is firing. And uh, what we have in the middle, this H, is what we call the mixing matrix. So basically, these are the action potentials uh, of uh, the different motor units. This is motor unit one, motor unit two, motor unit three, at the different channels, so, so from one to N. Now, uh, decomposing from a mathematical point of view basically means finds H, the H matrix, because 
if you imagine this uh, equation as a system where uh, the sources are, are your input and X, your EMG signal, is the output, and then H is uh, basically the mixing matrix that allows you to obtain X starting from S. So if you find H, basically you can invert uh, this equation and find out S from, uh, from X. And how do you obtain uh, H? Well, there are uh, uh, different uh, approaches. One uh, has been uh, uh, proposed, uh, the first one by Alesh on blind source separations. And uh, this uh, can be, a blind source separation basically means that you create a conspansion that uh, optimizes parsity of the signal. And I'll explain in a moment what, what it is. And you optimize in order to find this, uh, this H. And you can use different uh, cost function and that is correspond to different algorithms. For instance, like Alesh proposed the gradient convolution kernel composite, uh, uh, convolution kernel uh, compensation. <laughs> and uh, like there are also algorithms based on uh, uh, independent component analysis. Um, and uh, it's also possible actually to use uh, uh, artificial in intelligence in order to be able to find out, uh, to find out this, uh, this uh, uh, mixing matrix. Now, um, the important thing is that like uh, uh, usually in, a, in an experiment, like you have long signal, let's say like you have 60 seconds of signal. But uh, if you find out your age in the first 20 seconds of the signal, actually you can use 10 to... Uh, uh, find out your sources also in the next 40 seconds because you simply need to apply a matrix multiplication. And uh, um, so how this is done in practice, again, you'll see this afternoon during, uh, during the workshop, but uh, there is uh, something uh, um, important that needs to, to be mentioned is that like as uh, any uh, technology probably, also for uh, uh, identity surface decomposition, there are some limitations. And one limitation is that uh, uh, with uh, identity MG, uh, uh, the signals that contribute the most, the action potential that contribute the most to the signal are either due to units that are very superficial, so close to the skin, or they are big. And uh, in this case, for instance, all these black circles correspond to motor units that are active in a simulation signal. And this is the signal that the black signal that you have on the back. And when you decompose the signal, uh, uh, you are actually able to find, out, to find out only the units that are represented here in red. And this corresponds to the blue signal. So as you can see, the two signals are quite overlap. So basically, you are able to explain most of the energy of the signal. Uh, but this doesn't mean that only the red units were active. Simply because of the limitation of the technology, you can actually pick up only those that were uh, uh, large or superficial. Okay. So always take it when uh, when you do an experiment, so like take into account that what you obtain uh, is uh, um, subject to this limitation. And uh, um, I think actually, uh, in brief, this is what I want to tell you to introduce the, today's, uh, this afternoon workshop. Just I indicated all the references. So, so like, if you want to dig a little bit further on, uh, on what I, I uh, describe, you can, uh, you can find them. And of course, you can send an email uh, if you have any questions.